We're gonna swim back and run in the corner sun. We're gonna swim back and run in the corner sun. It's breakfast with Bob. It's breakfast with Bob. Poncho Man bringing us in breakfast with Bob. Not quite Kona edition. <laughs> My name is Bob Babbitt. We are brought to you by Hoka One One by Credo Tri Four Seasons Walleye, Challenge Daytona Form Goggles, Canyon Bikes, Norma Tech, Ampium and Velofix. You can. And our Challenge Athletes Foundation, our next guest last year, had his best race ever in Kona, taking second place, going sub eight. Mr. Timothy O'Donnell joins us. T.O., how the heck are you doing? Good, Bob. This is, I never thought I'd do a Breakfast with Bob Kona edition with a sweatshirt on. <laughs> There's a first for everything. <laughs> I know. I know. It's a, a little crazy time, especially coming off of last year. It's, what's, what's fascinating to me is you go into last year's race, and because of your ankle injury, you don't even know if you're going to be able to, what did you do, like five runs outside leading into that race? Yeah, it was literally like a couple of days before I, I hopped on my flight. Um, you know, I head out the Friday before race week, so only eight days. And uh, just right before we train in Lawrence, Kansas, leading into Kona. And it wasn't until that, you know, a couple of days before I hopped on the flight that I did my first run outdoors. I actually was a, it was a broken foot, Bob. I broke my fifth metatarsal uh, ah. seven weeks, seven weeks before Kona. So, But that was sort of crazy. a crazy. You had messed up, didn't you mess up the foot the year before and sort of redid it this last I did time? it. So yeah, I broke it in um in January of 18. Yeah. And uh it turns out it didn't heal properly, even though I was in a boot for like 10 or 12 weeks. Um so uh it was almost just like scar tissue holding the break together. And um yeah, I just kind of ripped that scar tissue and broke it again last year. And thinking from the perspective of you know what, I, I might not be able to race. Did that take the pressure off of, you know, hey, here's the guy who's going to be the next American to win in Kona. Did, 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 did you feel like you were going in with sort of playing with house money that, you know, I, I, I don't even know if I'm going to get to the starting line. If I get to the starting line, whatever I get is going to be great. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, you, obviously, you know all the stats, Bob. I was fourth in 18, and the winner is always coming from that top four, right? I mean, uh, always. <laughs> so yeah I mean then I think there was a lot of internal pressure for me knowing that um you know my first year training with Julie Dibbins I was able to you know have in 2018 have that solid race and finish fourth and kind of get back on track um I had a a rough year in, in 17 and um yeah so to you know know I was in such a great position and it's yeah it's it was definitely kind of one of those situations where I think the injury probably did put me at ease. I mean, at the beginning, it was, it stressed me out a lot. And uh, it wasn't just, I think, it wasn't just the fact that it was, took some pressure off, but I think it just made me appreciate being on, on the start line even more. So all of a sudden, I was just so happy and had so much gratitude for the fact that I made it, I'm here, you know, like whatever happens, I don't care. I just didn't want to miss this race. And um, with that, I just said, okay, well, let's just, um, play your cards and see what happens. When you look back at the type of training you did, you did a lot of aqua jogging, you did a lot of alter G. I remember years ago, uh, top American marathoner, Dathan Ritzenheim was doing 80 miles mm -hmm. a week on, on the alter G and ended up you know, qualifying for the, you know, for Olympic trials. And you can replace a lot of that outdoor running that has, Going through that, do you train differently now on the run? Do you still do the alter G and some of the other stuff? Yeah, I still do um, aqua jogging all the time. Um, luckily, we have the master spa right in our yard, so that's perfect for me to just get in and do my, um, you know, kind of weekly aqua jog. Uh, I haven't. Our plan was, if we were racing, I was going to incorporate the alter G uh, into our kind of pre-race prep, um, particularly getting closer to the to the races. Um, but you know. Most of them have been closed anyways. With, <laughs> with yeah. So that's something we'll save, yeah, for, um, you know, Challenge Roth, hopefully in July, um, which will be kind of the focus of next year. And then, of course, Kona. So cycling coach, uh, Matt Patrill. Now, obviously, you can focus on your cycling when you can't run. 
Right. There, did you change position? Did you change a, a number of things you were doing on the bike? So we had, there? yeah, when I started working with Matt um, and he works, him and Julie kind of work together tag team with um, the coaching plan, which has been amazing. And Matt has been such a big part of the team. And we've been working on my position all year last year in 2019. Um, and we didn't really, with the foot injury, we didn't really throw you know, a ton more on, but we really stepped up the quality and I could see, you know, doing kind of threshold intervals before Kona and Lawrence, I was like, you know, geez, 30 Watts higher or something, you know, just because I was really able to focus on my riding and recover. So I was doing the, the sessions much better. And I think that just made me more prepared to, to handle the, the bike, which can all, you know, we've seen it can be carnage for a lot of guys in Kona. You know, if you're, if you don't quite have that fitness and you, you try to hang with the, the big boys up front. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, they actually, the foot injury allowed me to become a better cyclist and kept me in the race and kept me fresher for the run. And during that ride, there was a point where you went into the lead and you've shown that before that you're not scared of the moment that you don't, does, you don't, it doesn't bother you to lead that race. And where a lot of people are scared of that moment, you, you play, you're racing against the biggest guys in the sport. When you go into the lead about, 68 miles or so and it's what you and Jan at that yeah. point what was what was going through your head you, you didn't even know you're gonna start the race and now you're <laughs> the helicopter's overhead you're yeah. with Jan for Dano everything's looking pretty good yeah we talked about this last year it was me Jan and Allie and uh, I thought to myself there's three gold medals here and none <laughs> of them are mine you know am I in the wrong uh <laughs> my batting above my weight but I mean, you know, 2015, my first podium, um, I was off the front and that was not by design. I just found myself there and, uh, you know, I was looking back and like, whoa, what's going on? Um, so this year it was, um, you know, coming down from Javi, got up to the front and yeah, I didn't look back, you know, I knew, knew that some of the guys would be there, but I just got into my rhythm and, uh, I knew if, if we rode consistent and strong that chase group like Cam and, um, Sebby and all those guys, they'd have a really hard time to, to bridge that gap to us. So when you get off the bike in second, I get, yeah, get off the bike in second and pretty much stay there, right? So now you've got Jan, who's in a different stratosphere at that point, breaking the course record. You're sort of by yourself. And then you've got Sebby and Ben Hoffman's running his way through the field, but you still got a gap. It's, it's a couple of minutes, getting down to a couple of minutes. When you, when did you, resign yourself to the fact that one, I'm not catching Jan. And two, I don't think these guys are catching me. I'm going to get second place. Yeah. Um, I was a little bummed to lose that time to Jan on the, at the last, um, I think it was around 90 or 95 miles. He kind of got away, but I also knew that, Hey, um, you know, you need to be smart and this is not your play right now. You were, you've just been on the front for a ton and there was a big gap. Like, no, just, just do your thing. You know, you're, you've, I've been in that race long enough. I know <laughs> sometimes it's better just to do your race. Um, and then when I, yeah, when I hit the run, I mean, Jan was maybe two minutes, a minute 45 up the road. Um, so not much time, but honestly, I wasn't in a position to um, take huge risks on the run because I was so unsure about my run fitness. Yeah. Uh, so I, I put that out of my mind and I honestly, I put the guys behind me out of my mind um, and just focused on, you know, how do I run my best run and focus on those details, my turnover, relaxing my shoulders, things like that, uh, making sure I'm fueling properly. And, and um, yeah, and I didn't worry about the other stuff. I can't control if Sebi's going to run me down or if Jan's running away to smashing the chorus record, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah, just focus on what I could do. And I kept getting um, feedback that Sebi, we, we were holding like three minutes almost the entire run. We were just kind of running the same pace. So, uh, when I saw him in the energy lab, when I was running out and he was running in, um, I, I felt like I looked better than he did. Um, or, I, you know, obviously to know how I look, but I just saw him. I'm like, okay. Um, you know, if you just keep doing what you're doing, you're gonna, you're gonna hold this gap. It's 249, 44 marathon, 759, 40, first American to break eight hours. Uh, that is a, a pretty damn special day. What did you learn about yourself through that? Did you go from not knowing if you're going to race, you've got a broken foot, and now you've had the, the greatest day an American has ever had in terms of time on, on that course. 
Yeah, it was crazy. I was running out of um, T2 and I saw the race clock and it was like, I don't know, it was like sometime, it was around like 5.10. And I'm like, oh, wow, I could break eight hours in Hawaii, um, but I have to run a 250 or under 250. And I've never run under 250 in Hawaii. And I'm like, okay, whatever, get to work. <laughs> so that was the only time I thought about it, you know, breaking eight until the very end when I was um, turning um, back on to um, uh, Leahy Drive. And someone was like, you got it. Like, you just got to run, you know, whatever pace for the next half mile. I'm like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, for me, it was, you know, I've been chopping, chopping wood a long time with this race. And uh I've never considered myself the most talented guy, but I've been um, persistent and I've, you know, just kept learning. And, and then in the race, I've been patient. And I think that, that, that pays off a lot. And there's a lot to be said about, you know, we all train a lot. And most of the times we train out of fear. We're always fearful that we're not going to be the fittest versions of ourselves, or, um, you know, not be absolutely ready to go. But, and for me in hindsight, that's, you know, fitness isn't performance. Um, you know, performance is so much more than that. It's being in the right mental state. It's being fresh. Um, it's having gratitude for being able to do something you love. And I think last year that was a real epiphany for me. So when you, uh, you think this week you turned 40, right? I come yep. I come <laughs> 40. It used to be 40, you're not going to be fighting for the win in Kona, but Look at all the guys are 37, 38, you're 40, yeah. and you're better than you were a number of years ago. What has it taken to become, how have you become better as you've aged? Well, I think I've learned, Bob, that um, there's more to just being, uh, to crushing your workouts. And I've really, with running, swimming, and biking, I've taken a step back and said, okay, how can I can't always just get fitter. I'm getting older. How can I get faster without necessarily just crushing more training? And that comes down to working on my bike position and getting more efficient, uh, lowering my coefficient of drag, um, you know, changing my run form a little bit, really making sure uh, I'm, I'm landing underneath uh, my hips with my, my foot strike and getting um, a more efficient run stride, uh, making sure my swimming is more efficient. I've been swimming. I joined my first swim team in 1986, Bob, and uh, I didn't really start – even I was always a very bullheaded swimmer. No, I'm just going to go in the distance lane. I'm going to train harder than everybody. And that's how I'm going to get good. And now I'm like, okay, well maybe, yeah, let's work on my, uh, my hand position and let's work on my rhythm in terms of my, my breathing and things like that. And it's taken a long time. I've never, my, ask my parents, I've never been a fast learner, Bob, but I, <laughs> I usually get to the right answer. So the pro triathletes organization, You've been intimately involved with this from the beginning. And during this time when you know, there's no races, a PTO has stepped up and put out, uh, put out dollars to help pros really keep functioning and, and, and keeping in the game till the world comes back, hopefully, to, to normal. How important has that been to you? Because it's obviously, as, as a guy who's, uh, your, most of your career is behind you with less in front of you. Right. But what the PTO is doing is helping that next generation. Why is that important to you to make sure that there, this legacy lives on? Yeah, honestly, I mean, it goes with whatever you do. Try to, to leave a place better than you found it, right? Um, and I think that's what we're doing with the PTO. And you're right. I, you know, my, uh, my athlete, like the generation of my, um, that I'm in, we're not really going to see the full effect of the PTO. No. Um, but you know, we, the sport's been great to us and we want to see the sport be better and we want to see more people fall in love with the sport. And that's really, um, you know, the PTO's mission, obviously it's focused on the professional triathletes, but it's us coming together, um, strengthening our voice and through that growing the sport and celebrating the sport. And I think that's really important. Uh, if we can really improve the presence of professional triathlon at an international level, um, and to a larger audience, the whole sport's going to grow. And, and we're excited to be part of that. Love it. So when you look back at your career, what, what do you look back as the toughest moment you had to deal with? Oh, there are a lot of tough moments, Bob. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I've I've had a couple of bad Konas, obviously. Um, and I, yeah, I think probably 17 was the hardest for me because I really thought I was in, you know, we just had Izzy and Rennie wasn't racing. So the whole spotlight was kind of on me. Um, and I really was in great shape. It was in, I was in the best shape I've, I've been in in my life. And, and I, it just, you know, it didn't come together. So, you know, I've had 2011, 14 were tough Konas. So after a while, you're like, oh man, how many times can you get knocked down? Right. You know, I've been, uh, in 2017, I still had been doing Kona since 11. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I can take much more of this failure, but here I am, you know? <laughs> so it's just that, yeah, it's, I think it builds so much character when you have that resistance, um, when you have that struggle. And as I look back, overcoming a lot of those failures and disappointments has been a big part of my career. And something about my career that I'm very proud about to be able to get, keep getting knocked down and getting back up and say, okay, what else do you got? Uh, you're not getting rid of me yet. Uh, it's yeah, I'm proud of that. Happiest memory from your racing day. Obviously last year was amazing. Um, my parents came to Kona in 2011 and I, I DNF, uh, ended up getting really sick for the race and they never came back. <laughs> They're like, Nope, we're done. We don't want to see that. So for them to come back 2019, especially knowing that um, they were just coming for me, they weren't coming to see me race well. Um, and I said that, I'm like, hey, I don't know how this is going to go. I may, I may not finish. Um, you know, Rini may not finish. We both have broken bones. <laughs> yeah. So to have them there and obviously Rini and Izzy at the finish line was pretty amazing. Um, and then out of that, uh, 2013 Kona 2 was, was pretty amazing. You know, Rini um, had that big win. Uh, I, was, I was fifth fifth overall first American, my, my best performance to that date. And we were getting married like two months later. So it was just this kind of culmination of, of our relationship and, and, you know, rising together. So that was a lot of fun too. And, and now you're going to be a daddy for the second time. Yep. Yep. We got number two on the way on new, due on new year's Eve, Bob. I love that. I love that. <laughs> when something like this, you're coming off your greatest year in Kona and obviously you're chomping the bit. Go, okay. I got second. Now this year I'm going to go win. And then COVID hits and the whole year's a wash. How do you deal with that? And what are the plans for next year? Yeah, it was, uh, man, yeah, it's, it was crazy going into this year. It's the first year, like I had um, really great opportunities like Challenge Roth and things like that. You know, these events that Collins Cup with the PTO, these events that are like, hey, we want you here. These are massive events. And, um, you know, we're finally asking you to come and, yeah. and, then, and then that's all gone. Right. That's all taken away. But, uh, to be honest, I mean, it's, it's sport, right? So there's a lot tougher situations for people going on right now. And, and I completely appreciate that. And obviously we have a healthy family, uh, which is the most, and most important part, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm just looking forward. Uh, I've committed to Challenge Roth next year. So for me, it's Challenge Roth and Kona. I've already qualified for Kona. My spot um, rolled over. I qualified in Cozumel at the end of last year. So I'm all set with that. I've got two races that I really want to focus on. And the other thing is, Bob, is I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm a numbers guy. And I saw a pattern in my Kona racing. It was one bad year, two good years. And I just finished the two good years. So this is my bad year. And I just, <laughs> Crazy. so yeah, 11, 14, 17, it would have been 20. Right. So I'm like, Hey, maybe it just was meant, you know, meant to be. There you go. Good. 2021. Yep. 2021. 2021. Back in the good part of the cycle. I love it. T.O. <laughs> always such a pleasure to chat with you, man. I, I love watching you get second last year. That was so gutsy, gutsy performance. Thanks, and sometimes buddy. you, you learn, you learn something that, about yourself that you didn't know right you you learn it it's funny you've been doing this forever and you're like well i only did five runs outside this year and i just ran the fastest marathon i've ever done and went something <laughs> you know, that that that's why you don't just mail in your stat sheet right it, you right exactly yeah what's going to happen on race day yep yeah that, and that's why uh, like the virtual racing it's just not the same you know it's yeah. uh it's it's what do you what do you bring together when you know to the table when you're all out there on the start line and, and things are real. Love it. 
Timothy O'Donnell has been our guest again. This is Breakfast with Bob, not quite Kona edition. Thanks everybody for tuning in. We'll catch you next time. Thanks. Thanks, Bob.